Hi everybody, welcome to Two Off the First. It's June 6, 2023, and I don't think this is a day many of us in the golf world are ever going to forget. I'm Ryan Ballingy. It's uh, it's good to have you here with us. This is a couple hours after I've recorded the original Two Off the First I was going to do today, which I'll still upload. But things have obviously taken a turn here. Right around 10 o'clock Eastern, started getting text messages from people asking me to be on radio shows and react and have thoughts, friends and colleagues in the industry alike. Uh, to what had happened today and let's bring you up to speed on all of that and try to break it down as best we can and I still think at the end of the day what we're going to talk about here for the next 20-25 minutes is going to leave us with a lot more questions than answers and perhaps in the back half of this we'll start to try to outline some of those and try to frame it a little bit where we go from here but an announcement came from the PGA Tour, DP World Tour and the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia through Live Golf that they had agreed to a merger of commercial operations that would ultimately result in the formation of a for-profit entity where the PGA Tour would bring its commercial assets, the DP World Tour would do the same, and the Public Investment Fund would bring the Live Golf assets and invest a minority equity stake in a new for-profit entity whose name is to be determined and that will going forward operate all three concepts with the noted I guess piece of this that Live Golf will be absorbed into the PGA Tour and DP World Tour structure, whether that's a separate entity or not, but specifically that Team Golf will uh, try to be a fit in this new entity. The the big headline, other than that, is that the litigation between the PGA Tour and the Public Investment Fund and Live Golf Inc. that will go away. That ends immediately. The Live Golf season. For this year, for 2023, will continue as scheduled. So will the PGA Tour schedule. And then, I assume at some point throughout the course of the year, this new entity will be formed quickly for the beginning of the 2024 PGA Tour season. There's also been a memo released from PGA Tour Commissioner Jay Monahan to the players. There is a player meeting at 4 o'clock Eastern today. Monahan will be at the RBC Canadian Open, which is this week's PGA Tour event. I assume he will be peppered heavily with questions, but as part of this memo, he indicated that he will remain the commissioner of the PGA Tour Inc. organization, which will stay a 501c6 membership organization, and that organization will continue to oversee and sanction the PGA Tour's functions. So exactly what is moved into this new entity as a kind of holding company, so to speak, operating company, remains to be seen whether players will have to remain members of the PGA Tour as a membership organization as a condition of having access to whatever is done under the PGA Tour umbrella. That remains to be seen. But it also has been indicated in this memo that the PGA Tour and the Public Investment Fund will have to come to an agreement on how they will bring PGA Tour or dip live golf players back to the PGA Tour and or DP World Tour based on what they call a quote-unquote evaluation of live golf and what that all looks like and how long it takes. Although you would have to assume with the Saudis investing heavily into this new concept that any kind of punitive effect that this would have had otherwise would mostly go out the window, if not entirely. So there's that. Everything else is still kind of in the air. It sounds like very few people, based on the conversations I've had in private and what I've seen publicly, very few people knew this was happening. And I, this is in a sport that is notoriously bad at keeping secrets. And to try to put this into some perspective, the people that could have known about this are obviously Jay Monahan, the very high echelon of the PGA Tour's executive leadership, the board, which by the way, Rory McIlroy is a member of the policy board along with three other player directors. So they maybe knew. They had to have been aware of something, right, you would imagine. Obviously the Saudis knew. But I don't think Greg Norman knew. And the reason I say that is because Yasser al Rumayan, who is the director of the Public Investment Fund, and Jay Monahan appeared in a taped conversation that aired on CNBC this morning, and al Rumayan was asked specifically, does Greg Norman know what's happened here? And Rumayan said he called Greg Norman just before they decided to do this interview, before they started, which means Norman was probably in the dark. And for Norman to be in the dark indicates that 
probably most people involved in this had no idea this was coming. And probably less than 20 people, maybe even less than 15 people, that, that were in golf, at least, knew this was happening. Kyle Morikawa got on Twitter, said he was shocked to find this out via Twitter. Other players have said the same. Other players have reacted at the RBC Canadian Open, set, sounding shocked, and I think reasonably so. I think we all are. But I think the initial first reaction is, how do you feel if you're Rory McIlroy or John Rahm or Scotty Scheffler or Tiger Woods or Ricky Fowler? Name the guys that have kind of put their name and speech out there against Liv, talking about not liking the source of funds or going after Greg Norman or going after Liv's an inferior product. All of those things they have done for more, a year, if not more, at this point. And now... This agreement creates a situation where they're going to have to effectively eat crow and welcome back many, if not all, of the players from Liv who defected, who took guaranteed money and have been paid on it, at least a good chunk of that, and now will be probably welcome back to the PGA Tour and that umbrella in some fashion. Now they also have to admit that they're working for a company that takes Saudi investment. So having been against that and vocally against that for many of them, that specific piece of this, that is going to be a tough moment. Jay Monahan looks, frankly, like a complete hypocrite. At this tournament, this week's tournament, the RBC Canadian Open, a year ago, he got on CBS Sports coverage of the event on the weekend and spoke openly and seemingly at the time, honestly, about his issues with the Saudi-backed financing of the Live Golf Tour, his issues that players who were signing up for Live Golf were taking money from a regime that financed the 9-11 attacks on the United States, and the, the famous line, you never had to apologize for being a member of the PGA Tour. Well, now that's kind of changed, Right? Two months ago, Jay Monahan, less than the two and a half months ago, at the Players' Championship, Jay Monahan was asked about rumors that Brooks Kepka might be interested in coming back to the PGA Tour. And he said at the time he did not see a path back for those players. That has clearly changed. Money talks is the big takeaway from all of this, right? Who knows what the amount of money that's going to be invested in this for-profit entity guess what? We're not going to know. Because it's a for-profit entity, and it won't have public shares. It won't be publicly traded. It's not a 501c6, so the Saudis don't have to tell anybody how much money they've put into this. But get the sense that there was reporting that the Saudis were willing to throw $20 billion at their own soccer league to give it legitimacy and attract better players, and no one cares about that league. Can you imagine what they're willing to throw at the PGA Tour? And whatever that number was, was in part enough reason to create this agreement. However, I do not think that money is the sole, it might be a big, but the sole reason for this agreement. And the reason is litigation. That litigation, the antitrust lawsuit initiated by 11 players who went to live and then taken over by Live Golf Inc. against the PGA Tour, has gotten to an impasse where the PGA Tour was seeking to have discovery against the Saudi Public Investment Fund and Al Ramayan, and to probably unearth information that the Saudis would never want to become public. At the same time, the PGA Tour would then be discovered against. They would have to open their books, talk about how they operate business, figure out how to explain to people where the money comes from and how it gets out to the players and what percentage of that looks like, and probably a lot of questions that didn't want to be opened up to public discovery either on their side. Live Golf has been a commercial failure. The ratings have not improved at all. It's been so bad that Live was not willing to share ratings data moving forward. They were asking less than a month ago for American viewers to pay $3 a day to watch Live Golf DC, just over Memorial Day weekend. And then they went from doing that and asking people to pay $3 to avoid having to watch it on the CW app 
to merging with the PGA Tour. So, I think the biggest takeaways here for the reasons for this, obviously money, then litigation goes away, both sides, and throwing the DP World Tour in this, by the way. The DP World Tour has effectively become a feeder tour to the PGA Tour. They knew in rejecting the Saudi money that they would, in trying, and they tried to purchase the DP World Tour, that they would have to then become an umbrella feeder or you know, part of the umbrella effectively to the PGA Tour. And they were offering purses for their bare minimum of $2 million. Not entirely, but mostly. And they were threatened by sponsors potentially leaving because they would force players and ultimately did force players into a situation where they felt compelled to resign their membership and create a situation where they could never participate in the Ryder Cup for so long as they weren't members, couldn't captain a Ryder Cup team, couldn't assistant captain a Ryder Cup team. Well, as a result of all this, the PGA Tour, DP World Tour, and Public Investment Fund in this new entity own a sizable portion of the Ryder Cup because the DP World Tour is one of three partners in owning the European stake in the Ryder Cup. Now, that group, the DP World Tour group, will be part of this new organization. So, presuming something doesn't change substantially, the PGA Tour will own a piece of the Ryder Cup, which embroils the PGA of America in this. Uh, that could still to be determined, but that could be a fascinating development in all of this. And that's just one of the many, many questions that come up as a result of this news. And I think it's worth going down the list of some of them. Not all of them. I'll put all of that at golfnewsnet.com. I think it will actually result in triple figure numbers at the end of the day. Some snarky, some real. But will there be payments to the players that frankly have been superstars and stuck this out for the PGA Tour? Will the Saudis come in and have a smoothing over payment? I don't know. They, they don't necessarily shouldn't feel entitled to one. They made their choice. So did the Live Golf players. Will the Live Golf players get paid in full for their contracts because they got initial upfront sums of money and some of them may have had yearly installments of money. Will they get paid on the rest of that or will they not? Will that be up to the individual negotiation? We'll see about that. What will the live golf schedule look like moving forward? Will it continue to exist at all? Will live golf as we know it go away? Because if it's absorbed into the PGA Tour, and the PGA Tour has both a majority of seats on the board and a majority stake of ownership, then, or at least a plurality of it, then in that situation, they could effectively just wipe Live Golf off the map and remove it from history. And in that case, maybe the idea of Team Golf on the PGA Tour schedule comes about at some point, but largely goes away. Who knows about that? Will there be PGA Tour teams? Will there be a separate tour, like a Live Golf structured tour, for the best players in the world, effectively ending the PGA Tour as we know it? We don't know about that. It could be a true separation of the PGA Tour into this upper tier tour, whatever you call it, and just have those events. That could be possible. You could have a separate PGA Tour schedule, or maybe you name that the PGA Tour and vice versa. I mean, the nomenclature thing, whatever. That could happen. Where does Greg Norman go? Is he out? Because his name wasn't mentioned in this press release announcing this merger whatsoever. Not once. Not quoted. Not name dropped. Is he out? Norman and his son seem particularly happy on Twitter. But does that mean he's out? Because I would think that would be one of the conditions of this merger. That Norman is not a part of anything moving forward. So that's something to wonder about. What happens to the Asian tour? The Saudi Public Investment Fund agreed to a 10-year, 300-some-odd million dollar investment in the Asian tour. And that investment was designed to create a feeder tour into live. And hopefully, what they thought initially, to help them get world ranking points. Well, they're not needed now. So will the Saudis continue to drop that relatively small sum of money in the grand scheme of things for them into the Asian tour? Or will they just cut it loose? 
What will happen there? That's still to be determined. What happens in the major championships? Do we just absorb all the players back into the PGA Tour and DP World Tour umbrella and forget any of this ever happened? What happens with the world ranking? Because if Live Golf continues throughout 2023 and they still don't get ranking points, which you would assume they won't because they're, what, eight of them left, then what happens to those players? Because they're not going to earn world ranking points except in the remaining two men's majors. So will they, if they come back to the PGA Tour, be ranked that in that fashion? What then happens to the relationship between the DP World Tour and DP World? Are the Emiratis out? Because the Saudis and the Emiratis are political rivals. Will the Saudis ask to push DP World out of being a sponsor? Will the Emiratis take themselves out of holding DP World Tour events for the DP World Tour? Will it go back to being the European Tour? Lots of questions there. That's to be sorted out as well. What will purses look like on the PGA Tour? In this memo, Jay Monahan says that the Public Investment Fund will be the premier corporate partner sponsor of the PGA Tour. Does that mean that the Saudis will effectively sponsor every event? Will they take over the title sponsorship of some? All? None? What does that mean? Will there still be asks of the likes of Travelers Insurance, RBC, Charles Schwab, AT&T, myriad different companies that are sponsoring these events for anywhere from 8 to $20 million? Will they be subsidized? How will that work? That's a very open question. Will the players seek to unionize? I think it's something that we really have to look at here in the coming weeks and years of all of this. And I ask that because the PGA Tour Inc. It remains a 501c6 organization, but the holding company of all these things will be a for-profit. So will the players seek to disentangle themselves with PGA Tour Inc., unionize like every other major professional sports league and negotiate with the PGA Tour moving forward? Or will that remain as it has been? Will there be, quote-unquote, labor peace, so to speak, between the PGA Tour players and the management? It is very clear today that this is not a member-run organization. And the players have to feel betrayed by Monaghan and perhaps some of their player-elected policy board members, who are, by the way, they're outvoted. They only have four votes out of nine. So they can't even force anything through. So even if they were in favor of this, they could have been vote, outvoted in the end. Or if they were against it, they could have been outvoted in the end. Either way. So, what does that do to the notion of the PJ Tour as a player-run organization? Will the players then ultimately decide, we want to do this a little bit differently? Because if it's a for-profit entity, where will that mean going forward? What will happen to the PGA Tour's charitable contributions? No, that's kind of a minor thing in the grand scheme of things, but billions of dollars over the history of the PGA Tour have been donated to charities through the events that have been run as for-profits, or excuse me, not-for-profit entities. Will that continue? We don't know about that. Or will they be for-profit entities, or will they all be wholly owned under this umbrella? And will that mean that ultimately the PGA Tour organization, whatever that n name is, will just dole out money to charities in a slightly different fashion. Don't know what that means. What's going to be the public backlash to this? So many people, the majority of people, probably a sizable majority of people, have been against live. The ratings show it. The reaction on social media has shown it. People are against the source of the money. Now that source of the money is running the PGA Tour, at least in part. I don't care if it's a minority stake, whatever it is. Now that money is here. What will the public reaction to that be? Will it be stark? Will it be bad? Will it plummet and crush ratings? We don't know the answers to those questions, and I still think there's a lot to be found out about that. The player reaction. We now have a true monopoly in golf, because now you will have the two biggest professional tours among men in the world under the same umbrella, formally as an organization. You'll have public investment fund money in there. So what happens to organizations like, again, the Asian Tour, the Sunshine Tour, 
the PGA Tour of Australasia. These are all organizations that have co-sanctioned events. They are involved together in the formation of the official World Golf Ranking. What will that look like? Because now this could be an even more closed shop. Will there be a backlash there? We don't know. <laughs> How much money the lawyers make? That's an incredible piece of this, and I don't think we're ever going to understand. But the amount of billable hours that went involved into this lawsuit from last summer to this year has to be, frankly, staggering. And they're the ones who won. Along with guys like Phil, DJ, Brooks, Bryson, Camp Smith. They took the money. They padded their bank account. Now they just have to finish a meaningless live season. And they're that away from getting back to the PGA Tour, most likely, if they want to do that. And frankly, who wouldn't? Because this is the future of professional golf. Saudi-backed money in the PGA Tour. There's a lot. And personally, I, I feel... I don't, I don't know what the right word is. But it feels really, I guess, upsetting having spent the better part of a year talking about the issues that I have with Live Golf and also trying to be somewhat neutral in my analysis of Live Golf in trying to take my what I acknowledge as personal bias out of it and trying to understand the differences between the two, the business interests of each, the competing situations in which they tried to coexist, and still acknowledging throughout all of that that the problem with Live was the source of the money and that that source of money was complicated. And in the end of the day, that was not something I was comfortable with. Well, now that source of money is in the tour. And what that means going forward, I think I'm still going to have to wrestle with for a while. And as someone who covers golf at the professional level, something I'm going to have to wrestle with for quite a long time. As someone who owns a media company that talks about it, it's going to be something that's going to conflict with my belief set for a long time. Maybe with yours too. Maybe not at all. Your reaction may differ. But I think it's something that every individual person who's probably taken a stake in this of one way or another, and you have been may have been completely indifferent to all of this, but you're going to have to think about it. You're going to have to decide what you feel about it if you had an emotional investment one way or the other. It's probably, frankly, easier for people who took the live side to reinvest back in the PGA Tour because they're being welcomed in by the PGA Tour. The other way around, which is the majority, might be not as easy. And I think there's still a long, long fallout to come from this. And this is just the beginning. Like I said, we have so many questions, so many unanswered, so many that will be answered, so many we'll never know. But at 4 p.m. today, the players have a meeting with Jay Monahan at the RBC Canadian Open, and I cannot tell you how much money I would pay. It'd be a lot to be in that room and hear that conversation and understand that moment of history. But I'm sure we'll learn more. Leaks will come in the days to come, even though this is probably the best-kept secret in the history of golf, probably, that eventually some mouths will open and we'll learn more about this. And we'll talk about it here on this show, but it sounds like the Live versus PGA Tour era is closed, and now it's the PGA Tour Saudi era that we have to figure out. So we'll do that here on the show. Everything else kind of seems relatively unimportant, but I'm sure we'll be back with the show tomorrow to talk about something related to this, and it'll probably dominate our shows for a while. If you listen to the show as a podcast, thanks for doing that. If you can give us a five-star review, leave us a comment. I'd appreciate it. It helps us reach more people. If you're watching on YouTube, thanks for doing that. Consider subscribing to our channel and liking the video, leaving a comment. I'm happy to get back to you. If you catch us through some other fashion, video or audio, thanks for spending some portion of this momentous day with us. Uh, it is very much appreciated. We'll be back next time. I'm Ryan Balaji. Very much shocked by everything happening today. We'll see you next time on Two of the First.